Hi everyone, this is Gaurav Gupta, your convener. I'm recording this lecture because the morning lecture got corrupted. We don't know why. This week's lecture is on classes and objects. Now, classes and objects are very useful. It's one of the core topics of Comp 125 and required for Comp 229 specifically. 45% of your first PRAC exam is based on classes and objects, so you might want to pay attention. Unlike the previous topics, class and objects doesn't have a lot of problem solving element. It's more procedural, so if you pay attention and you stick to the basics and you don't make the silly mistakes, then it's very difficult to actually lose marks. So we're going to open the lecture and take a look at what we are going to do. So. The first question is, what is classes and why do we need them? To explain this, consider the example of a ball. A ball is represented by not one attribute but many attributes. Its x location, its y location, its speed in the x location, its speed in the y location, its diameter or radius, color, and so on and so forth. The example I'm taking here is a soccer player and I'm interested in the soccer players efficiency in goal scoring so each soccer player has a name the number of shots that he or she takes over the game over the career over the season whatever and how many goals do they actually score because name shots fired and goals scored are all Collectively describing a player, we call these instance variables of a player. Because these are the variables that exist for every single instance of a soccer player. So Ronaldo has a name, number of shots he's scored, number of goals he's shots he's taken, goals he's scored. Samantha Kerr, she's got a name, she shoots, she scores, and so on. Using shots taken and goals scored, we can calculate the success rate and the success rate will always be between 0 and 100. But because it's a function of these two instance variables, we implement it as a method. So what are methods? Methods, methods are any value that, that is calculated as a function of another value or other values. To represent a class, we use what's called a UML class diagram. A UML class diagram has three compartments, the top compartment, middle compartment, and bottom compartment. The top compartment is the class name. It starts with an uppercase letter and is camel cased. The middle compartment has the instance variables and their data types. The bottom compartment are the list of instance methods and you add any parameter apart from the instance variables in the parameter list. You don't need to add the instance variables to the parameter list because the method has knowledge of the instance variables already and the return type for the instance variables. So our player class looks something like this. Each player has a name, shots taken, goals scored, as the instance variables. The data type I've used is text integer integer which obviously doesn't exist in Java but it's more fundamental. So we want to make our diagrams as generic as possible for different languages. The success rate is a function that returns a real number because it can be 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.1 or 0 0.9 or 1.0. Once you've created the class, then you can create instances of that class, which we call objects. For example, Messi is an instance of the class. Higuain is an instance of the class. And Kante is a third instance of the class. And you can create as many instances as you want. Of course, for each instance, the instance variables have some value. We represent an instance using an instance diagram or an object diagram. 
An object diagram has three compartments. Well, it actually has only two compartments because the third compartment is empty. The top compartment is the name of the object and which class it belongs to. And the second compartment has the values for its instance variables. For example, Messi is a player. His name is Lionel Messi. He's taken 85 shots this season and he scored 27 goals. Higuain is another player whose name is Gonzalo Higuain. He's taken 153 shots and scored only four goals. Uh, sorry, Higuain. Kante plays defensive midfield. He takes only seven shots over the season and he scored one goal. We can have another example of a car trip starting from the beginning. A car trip for example, when you take a trip in the car, you travel some distance and you take some time. Using these, you can calculate average speed. So we say distance travel and time taken are instance variables while average speed is an instance method. Similarly, for internet users, a data plan class, you have some allowance and you've used some of the allowance so far in the month. The methods we can implement on this is what percentage of the allowance have you used, how much allowance is left. Now, I would like you to draw your attention towards the exercises we have included in the lecture notes. So these are really helpful for you if you solve each of this exercise when you study the lecture notes. The first one is what are the instance variables for the date entity? The calendar kind, not the romantic kind. So date has day, month, and year. The instance methods you can operate are how many days are left in the year, how many days have passed since the beginning of year, etc. So your instance methods, sorry, instance variables are day, month, year, and methods are, is it a leap year? Is the current year a leap year? So you'll see that I'm not passing any attribute, any parameters, because it already has the knowledge of the year of the instance on which it is called, and how many days are left in the year. If you create an object representing the 19th of April, then its object diagram will look like this. The name of the object, date of birth, day is 13, month is 4, and year is 2014. And that represents 13th of April, 2014. So that's about designing a class, and now we can come to defining a class. Every class is defined in a separate file typically, but you can always, you can also have multiple classes in the same file, provided only one of them is a public class. But we'll talk about that later, so it's not very important to get into the details right now. But the first thing we'll do is we'll add instance variables to a class. So over here, I've got a project classes objects project. I'm going to create a new class and call it rectangle finish. So you can see it automatically creates a public class rectangle. Let's increase the font size a little bit. General appearance, colors and fonts, Java, Java editor, and change the size to 18 so we can see it much clearer. There you go. So you've got public class rectangle. Instance variables are added as a list of variables here and in the beginning we're going to add it as public so each rectangle has some width and some height which means every single rectangle we create will have a width and a height they're both of type double plus means that it's public and clearly minus means that it is private. Public means that everyone has access to the width instance variable, so we can, any client, any client that creates a rectangle object can modify that. Now, as I go along, I have exercises 
for you to repeat what I've done using the circle class. So I'm not going to show the solution. You should do that on your own. Declaration and instance instantiation of objects. So once we've created the rectangle class, what we've done is we've created a data type. That rectangle is a data type, but we haven't created any objects of that data type. So what we'll do is we'll create a new class, call it the client, include public static void main, because it's a program that is going to execute. And it's inside the main method that we write our Java code, as we've seen in the first two weeks. So we create a rectangle object R. Now, if that's all I do, and let's try to display R dot width. I'll explain this in a little while. Or let, let's just display the object R. When I run this, it says the local variable R may not have been initialized, and that is correct because R is a label, but it doesn't have any value for width and height. In order to do that, we need to implement the instantiation method, which is R equals new rectangle round brackets. So we say R equals new rectangle round brackets. If I display the object now, you'll see a gibberish value. Well, semi gibberish. Classes, objects, project, dot rectangle at 61064425. This value 61064425, uh, tec technically known as the hash, is an indication that R refers to an object. So in this case, you can see R refers to another memory area where the instance variables are stored. And that's how objects are created. This notation scheme is very important. So R is the object name. It's a reference. And it refers to a block of memory storing the instance variables. <clears throat> you can also add instance methods in a class. So in this example, I've added two instance methods, area and checking if the rectangle is a square or not. So I'll put these methods in. Now, instead of displaying the rectangle, if I display r dot, so next thing is the dot operator. The dot operator is like apostrophe s in the English language. So when I say Gaurav's class, or maths workshop, it's like that. So if I've created an object R, if I say R dot width, it means width instance variables, variable of the object R becomes five. So here, as soon as I put a dot, you can see it displays height, width, area, and is square amongst other things. But don't worry about equals, get class, hash code, etc r dot width equals 5. Similarly, I can say r dot height equals 8. I can display r dot width followed by a space followed by r dot height. When I run this program, I get the values 5.0, 8.0, at the bottom over here. Let's see if I can increase the size of the console as well. Uh, general appearance, colors and fonts. can't find that anyways you can live with this 5.0 8.0 now the interesting thing is what happens if I display its area so instead of displaying the area directly I'll say double a equals r dot area 
Notice, when I say double A equals R dot, it displays height, width, area, and A square as well, which it shouldn't, but anyways, R dot area. You get a yellow exclamation because you haven't used the variable area, which is fine. Let's display the variable A. Now what I'll do is, I'll put breakpoints in my program. I'll put a breakpoint over here, on line 9, on line 11, and on line 13. In my rectangle class, I'll also put a breakpoint I'll change it slightly and return this way. I'll put a breakpoint on line 9. Now, and line 8, let's say. Now, instead of running my program directly, I'm going to run it in the debug mode. So, once you put the breakpoints where you want to stop your program, I'm going to run the program in debug mode. So, when I debug the program, It stops the execution wherever the breakpoint is there. So you can see that the first breakpoint is on line 9, and before it executes, an object R has been created. It has an ID of 20, and if you expand this, its width and height are 0. I can also add breakpoints in the middle of the program. When I resume the execution you resume using this yellow rectangle and green triangle the slow motion icon it goes to the next step and now width has become 5.0 if i resume height has become 8.0 if i resume you see that it goes into the area method let's do this one more time shall we so we'll go into debug and debug the program we've seen the first this time the ID is 21 I'll add a breakpoint on line 12 now it stopped at area but the method call is R dot area so it's calling the method area on the object R notice the ID of rectangle R here it's 21 when I resume, it will jump into the area method. When it jumps into the area method, it has only one variable, this. And this has ID 21. But wasn't that the ID of object R? What this implies is that when you call a method on an object, that object, the reference of that object is copied into a special object called this. If I expand this, you'll see that width is 5 and height is 8, which means width, sorry, this is nothing but the calling object, in this case, object R. It calculates the result as 5.0 multiplied by 8.0, which is 40.0, and returns it to the caller, which is caught in the variable A. So A becomes 40.0 and we display our result on the console. So that's how the dot operator is used and that's also debugging an instance method. Are there any instance vari uh, default values for the instance variables? As we just saw here, yes. So integers have a default value of zero. Strings and any object has a default value of null We'll talk about that later. Double has an instance value of 0.0. .0. Booleans have a default value of false. Now, next thing, getters and setters. Let's say a different kind of client. So the client now is something like this. Let's get rid of all of these. And I create a new rectangle. And this is how I can combine declaration and instantiation. I can say rectangle R is a new rectangle. 
rectangle R equals new rectangle round brackets. I'm initializing its width to minus 5, is, which clearly is not possible. You cannot have a negative width for a rectangle. So when I run this, its area comes out to be minus 40, which is ridiculous. This happens because I'm able to change This happens because I'm able to change the value directly in the client to minus 5. And this happens because my visibility of the instance variables is public. So clearly we don't want anyone to access it directly, so we change it to private. Let's save this. As soon as I change it to private, my client gives you an error. And this is because you cannot access width and height directly. So what we do is we add these special methods called getters and setters. Getters are very simple. All that getters do is they return the value of the instance variable. So in my rectangle class, I'm going to add public double get width, which returns the width. And similarly, get height which returns the height. So that's all getters do. They simply return the instance variable. And whatever is the data type of the instance variable is the data type of your getter. We also add setters. Now setters can be void. Setters can be boolean. Setters can have whatever return type you want. But in the beginning, we'll just keep them as void. Set width. So what you're doing is you're trying to assign a value to the instance variable width, which means we have to pass it a value that has to be assigned. If I di r directly write width becomes w, it doesn't help me because if the client gives you a negative value, you copy it into width. In this example, we are using math.absolute. Math.absolute converts any value to its positive value and then assigns it to the width. Similarly, we have public void set height double h and height becomes math dot absolute h. Once we've done this, we can go to the client and now Eclipse is incredibly powerful. It gives you so many hints all the time. You can now see that there is a, when you hover over width, it says replace with the setter. Provided you've implemented the setter correctly, you can simply replace the call by saying r dot set width minus 5 and r dot height becomes 8. If you hover over this method and press command on a Mac or control on a Windows, it gives you option for declaration and implementation, which is the same thing as far as 125 is concerned. If you click there, it actually takes you to the method, which is awesome. Similarly, set height is there as well. Notice if you change set width to a lowercase w, it's not going to work. So it needs to be the same method exactly. When you save the program, now you can see that the error is not there anymore. When I run my program, it displays 40.0 correctly. I can also display r dot the width and height attributes. Can I display the width as r dot width and the height as r dot height? Is that possible? No, because width and height are private. If you expand rectangle.java, there's a class rectangle. If you expand rectangle, now you can see width and height have red squares, which is private. If I change it to public, you can see width has a green circle. So green circle public, red square private. So let's change that to private again. Because width and height are public, it says the field width is not visible. 
So we can replace this by the getter and again replace height by the getter and now we have the right values. When I run this, we can see that the width is 5.0, height is 8.0 and area is 40.0. So setters up provide logic wherever required and in this example it was math.absolute. You can imagine if there are many instance variables, assigning each instance variable individually is very cumbersome. Instead of that, it would be awesome if I could just say rectangle R is new rectangle minus 5 and 8 and automatically minus 5 got assigned to width and well not minus 5 5 got assigned to width so through the setter and 8 got assigned to the height let's see how this is done if you just hover over that method you can see there's something called create constructor rectangle int comma int because minus 5 and 8 are integers it expects integers but if I say minus 5.0 and 8.0 it says create constructor rectangle double comma double so I click that and it constructs a very special method called a constructor constructor is very special because it has no return type not even void and its name is exactly the same as the name of the class in fact it's the method that is called when you instantiate an object. So when you say create a new rectangle, you can see that it's actually a method. So the method rectangle is called with parameters minus 5.0 and 8.0. If I write here, width becomes D and height becomes E. Would that be correct? Not at all, because we've bypassed our setter logic so the constructor should always call the setters set width to w and set height to h where i'll change the name of these variables from d and e to w and h so we save this go to the client save the client again and the error is gone if I put a breakpoint on line number 6, also I put a breakpoint on line number 8 and ten, 9. Finally, we put a breakpoint on line 35 and 39. When I go into the debug mode and resume, you'll see that it goes to the constructor after line 6 so now we are in line 8 and you can see this is a there is a this object which refers to the calling object r its width and height are 0 and the parameters are w equals minus 5 and h equals 8 it calls the setters set width so when I resume the control has transferred to set width again this is the calling object which is r the value of w is minus 5 what happens is width becomes absolute of w which is plus 5 and it goes back to the constructor when it goes to the constructor now width has been assigned the value 5 then the constructor calls set height which becomes the absolute of h which is 8.0 goes to the cons goes to the constructor which goes back to the caller and all the breakpoints tumble down like dominoes and you get our values width is 5.0 height is 8.0 and area is 40.0 so the good thing is you can construct as many constructors as you want you can also add a second constructor public rectangle double so we need only one value if both width and height are the same value. So that's a constructor for a square. If I create 
now I can say there's only one value which is minus 5.0 when I run this it calls this new constructor and both width and height become plus 5.0 5.0 5.0 25.0 now you'll see that if I call the default constructor which I successfully did earlier it doesn't let me do that so when I run this it says the constructor rectangle is undefined in that regards uh, Java is like a jealous boyfriend or girlfriend basically what it's saying is that hey if you're smart enough to define these constructors why don't you go ahead and def define your own default constructor as well which is exactly what we'll do. So once you define para parameterized constructor, the default constructor is no longer valid. So you have to define it yourself. Okay, so if there are no parameters, what should the width be? What should the height be? It really depends on you. So in this example, I'll say by default, rectangles are of size two and two by five. Go to the client, refresh and run and you can see that the rectangles are 2.0 by 5.0 which is 10.0 so far so good next so please read these points carefully about the constructor in the lecture notes displaying objects so you can see here that every time I want to display the details of R I have to write all these values I should I can also write it in one statement like this that it's r dot get width plus r dot get height plus in brackets area equals plus r dot area plus brackets close and it is like that if I have another rectangle s which is 4.27.3 we'll have to do the same thing over s and when I run this that's my second rectangle so this can get quite annoying instead of that it would be lovely if I could just display the object and its details come up but right now when I do this it just spits out semi gibberish value which is the reference indication the method that you need to add to a class to display the details when its output is the to string method the to string method returns a string and you can return whatever the width is now please remember I don't need to call access width using get width I can access width directly because we are within the class so as long as you're inside the class you can access private instance variables directly as well so you can say width by height plus area equals plus whatever the area is and the closing bracket so if you call this method on object r it will become r dot width r dot height and r dot area if you call it on s it will become s dot width s dot height and s dot area and so on so you go to client and when i run this it displays it beautifully so the good thing is that i don't have to call to string explicitly it is automatically called when I display the object you can also store it in a variable if you want so I can say string string val is s dot to string and I can display that variable it will give me the same output that is because to string returns a string which is then copied into this variable of type string <coughs> and that's your to string method 
Next, a shallow copy versus a deep copy, which is a really important point going forwards. Sorry about the poor indentation here. I'm going to fix this indentation. I wrote this in Markdown and the indentations weren't very clear. So anyway, I'll do this at a later stage, but very soon. Now, shallow copy means when you copy an object into another object using the assignment operator equals. I already have a rectangle object R. Let's say it's of size 3.2 and 6.7. I display object R and I assign R into S directly. Then let's display the object S. When I run this, you can see that R and S are the same. What I'll do is, I'm going to add a statement before. And then I'm going to add a statement after. So clearly, they will be the same before and after. I can also add a slash n in front of that, which is a new line character. So before r is this and s is this. Similarly, after r is this and s is this. So you can see that R and S are the same. Let's add a breakpoint after S equals R. So on that and after that. Enter the debug mode. You can see that. Remove it from the constructor and the setters. We don't want to go there. Debug again. This time, the first time it stops is at line 7, where R has been created, and it has ID 20. When I resume, R is copied into S. But what R actually holds is a reference to the instance variables. So that reference is copied into object S. When you copy R into S, it copies the reference into object S. So R holds a reference represented by ID 20. When I resume, you can see S also has an ID of 20. So in fact, both objects R and S refer to the same instance. If I stop the execution and between between before and after, I change r dot width to three, one one point seven and r dot height to two point three. First of all, I can't do that directly because width is private. So if you just hover there, you can replace it with the setter. Replace it with the setter. If I run this now. You can see both, just by changing the width and height of R, width and height of both R and S has changed. Because R and S, in fact, refer to the same instance. And that's called a shallow copy. On the other hand, if I create S as a new rectangle, and the value we are using for width is coming from r.getWidth and the value for height of s is coming from r.getHeight. We place breakpoints at line 7 and at line 9. When I debug my code, r has a reference of 20. Height is 6.7, width is 3.2, height is 6.7. Resume, you'll see that S has a different ID. It has ID 23. So it's actually a different instance. 
So R refers to an instance where width is 3.2 height is 6.7. S refers to another instance where the width is also 3.2 and height is also 6.7. But they are individual objects. They are independent objects. When I resume again, this time you see when I change the width and height of R, R gets changed but S does not get changed. And that's about deep copy. So what we just created here is a deep copy. Of course, there are many ways to create a deep copy. You can also create a default object and then say S dot set width to R dot get width and S dot set height to R dot get height. And now this collectively is a deep copy. So remember shallow copies as all objects or all the shallow copies referring to the same instance while deep copies copy means that each object refers to this to an individual instance of course they all have the same values so here's an example if i copy destination source directly into destination they both refer to the same object if i change the value of the destination's width the width of both source and destination change on the other hand in a deep copy, if I say destination.set width to source.get width and destination.set height to source.get height, source refers to its own instance and destination refers to its own instance. They have the same values. If I change the width of destination to triple eight point eight eight, destination.width changes but source.width does not change and that's a shallow copy. Next part and one of the most important parts of this lecture is how to compare objects. The deal is that you cannot compare objects by using equality and I'm going to remove the modification in R and you can see that now R and S in fact have this sim have similar contents. If I say R equals S system dot out dot println same same else println different la la is a thing I picked up when I was doing my masters in Singapore completely irrelevant to the lecture anyways so what what equality checks in objects is its contents but what are the contents of these objects r and s it's the reference even though r and s have the same value of width and height they have different references so when i run this it actually says different because S is a deep copy of R. So let's change the deep copy back to its compact form and run this. So because we are making a deep copy, they're different, even though their contents are the same. If I say S equals R and I make a shallow copy, it means they both refer to the same instance, which means they both hold the same reference. So their contents in terms of memory are the same. So when I run this, it says same same but of course it's a problem when there are two objects that have the same instance variables we want them to be determined as equal so while you can compare primitive data types with the equality operator you cannot compare objects using equality operator uh, so I have put an explanation of whatever I said over here. What we do is we add a method called compare to in the class we have. We can we call it on an object of that class and we pass the object to which we are comparing it to. Of course you don't have to compare rectangles with rectangles. You can also compare rectangles with circles, 
rectangles with hexagons etc but generally you compare objects of the same type compare to returns three values compare to returns one if the object on which you call compare to is greater than now greater than in terms of what in my example it's area but if you're comparing students it could be GPA if you're comparing stock items it could be unit price if you're comparing rooms again it could be the height of the room and so on so first you determine the order or the criteria that orders items if the calling object is more it's you return 1 if the calling object is less you return minus 1 if the calling object and the parameter object are the same you return 0 so now what I'll do is I'll go back to Java perspective right now I'm in the debug perspective you can see that in the top right corner if I click on this J it goes to the Java perspective I'll go to my rectangle class and add a method public int compare to and the object I'm comparing a rectangle with is another rectangle object which we call other slash star star introduces a special comment called a Java doc above my method parameter other and return one if calling object calling objects area so if area of calling object is more than area of parameter object minus one if area of calling object is less than area of parameter object and zero if area of calling object equals area of parameter object now intentionally I'm gonna make some mistakes here so please don't memorize this straight away now based on the logic I can implement it the first thing is you should remember that this holds a reference to the calling object if I can ever type correctly also the parameter object is passed into other so we're going to use this and other to differentiate between the calling object and the parameter object so we can say double a is this object's area double call it a1 and a2 a2 is other objects area now if I go by the book and implement exactly as the Java doc tells me I'll do something like this if a1 is more than a2 return 1 if a1 is less than a2 return minus 1 and if a1 equals a2 remember a1 and a2 are primitive data types so they can be compared using the equality operator return 0 you'll see that my method has an error it says this method must return a value of type int but why does that not happen let's see so I'm going to go to a website called code to flow which is a beautiful website to generate flow diagrams flowchart diagrams try now for free and all I'm going to do is I'm going to paste my code there and you can see that a1 is this dot area a2 is other dot area if a1 is more than a2 it returns true if it's false it comes here if a1 is less than a2 it returns um, sorry if a1 is more than a2 it's true and returns 1 if a1 is more than a2 is false then it comes here if a1 is less than a2 is true it returns minus 1 if it's false it comes here and notice that if a1 is equal to a2 only if a1 is equal to a2 it returns 0 but what happens if it's not 
you see that it's possible that my program could take this path hypothetically. Of course, mathematically speaking, it can't because even will I, there be more than, less than or equal to. But Java is pretty stupid, right? That way, it doesn't know that it will be one of the three conditions, will be true. Which means that we have to add a placeholder and that placeholder can be anything. You can say return triple six. Doesn't matter. The important thing is that my code returns a value in all possible parts of this flowchart. So you can see over here I can return 666 and it gets rid of the error. So this is simply to satisfy Java. Of course we don't have to do it like this. An easier method would be if a1 is more than a2 return 1. So if the control comes here What does that mean? If we are still in this method on line 74, what does that mean? It means that line 72 did not execute, otherwise it would have returned the control. Which means that A1 was not more than A2, which means A1 more than A2 return evaluated to false which means A1 is less than or equal to A2. Okay, so we check is A1 less than A2. We return minus 1. If control reaches here, means A1 less than A2 is also evaluated to false. It means that the only option available is A1 is equal to A2 which means you don't have to check that explicitly. You can return zero directly because it's the only possible outcome at that stage. So there you go. Compared to is fairly straightforward. You decide what criteria it is. In this case, the criteria is the area, which means you return 1, minus 1, or 0, based on that. So we go back to client, and now I'll have two rectangles, R and S. Let's take some simple values, because we don't want to confuse people too much. Just a little bit, yeah? And it's uh, 3 by 5 and 4 by 4, which we can call using square constructor as well, if you want. And I'll create a third rectangle T whose width is 8 and height is 2. I can call compare to on any object. I choose object R and I compare it to possible options for the parameters are R S and T, I choose S. So when I compare R to S, the area of R is 15. The area of S is 4 times 4, 16. R being the calling object, it will be copied into this. S being the parameter object, it will be copied into other. So this holds R. This is a shallow copy of R. Similarly, other is a shallow copy of the parameter which in our case is S. So this area is R dot area which is 15. Other area is S dot area which is 4 times 4 16. Is 15 more than 16? No. Is 15 less than 16? Yes. And it returns minus 1, which we display on the screen. So we get minus 1. If I change this and write it as s dot r, this time my calling object is s. So this is a shallow copy of s. 
my object that I'm passing is R. So other is a shallow copy of R. A1 is this dot area, which is S dot area, which is 4 times 4, 16. A2 is other dot area, which is S, uh, R dot area, which is 3 times 5, 15. Is 16 more than 15? Yes, it returns 1. So when I run this, you can see that the output is 1. If I compare T with R, T has an area of 8 times 2, 16. R has an area of 3 times 5, 15. So we'll get 1 again. If I compare T with S, T has an area of 8 times 2, 16. S has an area of 4 times 4, 16. And because the areas are the same, it returns 0. And you can see when the area is the same, your output is 0, which is exactly what I want, what we want. And that gives you an example of compared to. What we'll now do is we'll write some JUnit tests for a new class. I'm going to create a new class for a fraction object. Fractions can be intimidating, but they don't have to be. A fraction simply is a numerator divided by the denominator. So these are the instance variables. Very quickly, we're going to write the getters, get numerator, return numerator. get denominator returns denominator set numerator basically there's no constraint you have to pass the value you want to set it to so call it n numerator becomes n no validation required because numerators can be anything negative positive zero anything set denominator to n to d but denominator cannot be zero because otherwise you'd be dividing by zero so if d is zero we make d equal to one we first change it to one and once it's changed we can say denominator becomes d of course what we can also do is we can say if d is zero denominator is zero otherwise denominator is d so denominator is assigned a value based on whether d is 0 or not. The next method we'll write is public fraction, which is the constructor, int n int d, set the numerator to n, and set the denominator to d. So even if the client passes 0, we'll change it to 1. Our two-string method which returns numerator for divide by denominator a method public double get value so because we are storing it as numerator and denominator we need a value which is numerator times 1.0 divided by denominator the reason I'm multiplying it by 1.0 is that I'm storing them as integers so if numerator is 7, denominator is 2, 7 by 2 will return 3 because they are both integers. So one thing I can do is I can cast one of them to double before I divide by denominator or I can multiply it by 1.0. Either way is fine. But I guess most of the programmers would use this style, so I'm just going to say this. Our two string is num denominator plus brackets and then its value. Our method public int compare to so comparing fraction with another fraction of course whichever fraction is has a higher value we return that so we could do val1 is this dot get value double v2 is other dot get value if v1 is more than v2 return 1 
if v1 is less than v2 return minus 1 and in all other cases return 0 please note that this comparison comparing real numbers which is double using more than less than and equal to is very dangerous because they all sometimes have rounding of errors for example 5 by 2 might not necessarily be stored as 2.5 it might be stored as 2.49999 so this is really dangerous and it should not be done but for the time being we'll just use that to write the client we'll create a new class actually you're uh, testing it right so we're going to write a test method for this so we go to fraction right click new j unit test case you can choose which version the latest one is jupiter we're going to use that class under testing is fraction we want to check setters constructors get value and compare to no need for com checking to string it will ask you to add the library to the path which we do now set numerator we'll create a fraction and set its numerator to 4 you'll see there is an error because we created a parameterized constructor as soon as I created that the jealous boyfriend girlfriend syndrome kicked in and Java took, took away our default fraction which we add as 0 over 1 so we go back now it's okay we set it to 4 and we expect the numerator of fraction f to be 4 so we say assert equals that 4 is the value of f dot get numerator similarly so that's 1 should negative values be allowed yes so we say minus 7 now it should be minus 7 lastly is 0 allowed yes so it should be 0 we're going to do the same thing for denominator so I of course do a lot of copying and pasting when I write your prac exams and your assignments you have to be very careful when you do that that you replace all the values okay so is positive value allowed yes is negative value allowed yes is zero allowed no we know that the logic states that it should become one our fraction constructor with two integer arguments so if I create a fraction with minus 3 by 7 we want to check or confirm that minus 3 is the value of f numerator and 7 is the value of f denominator I can always reinstantiate this object this time I don't declare it because I've already declared it once this time it's 6 divided by 0 which is not possible so numerator should be 6 and denominator should be 1 get value let's use the same 2 what should be the value of f it should be minus 3 point 0 divided by 7 similarly here it should be 6.0 divided by 1 so let's change that to 6,4 it should be 6.0 divided by 4.0 or just 4 one of them should be a float compared to I'll create three objects f g and h f is minus 3 by 7 
g is 2 by 8 and h is 4 by 16. So g and h are the same. What about f compared to g? Similarly, what about f compared to h and lastly what about g compared to h you can see f is negative so it is definitely less than g so it's minus one instead of f compared to h let's try h compared to f f is h is positive f is negative so h is clearly more than f g and h are 2 by 8 and 4 by 16 which are both 1 by 4 so it should be 0 all right so we're gonna run our tests and you can see one of them fails expected 1.5 by 6.0 because I clearly changed clearly get value fails so let's go to get value which is here and 6 by 4 oh because I forgot to change the method it's not the numerator it's the value that I'm accessing so we save this run this and you get the green line that all my tests pass but get value is a very risky test it can fail okay so if we if we change it to something like 1 over 3 so 1 and 3 so it's 1.0 divided by 3 similarly we change this to let's say 200 over 300 so it should be 2.0 divided by 3.0 or 3 let's try to make it fail shall we so it's 200 comma 300 and 1 comma 3 let's run this okay it passes still but instead of 1.0 by 3 if I write 0 0.6666 instead of 2 point my mistake sorry instead of 1 by 3 we write 0 0.3333 instead of 2.0 by 3 we write 0 0.6666 let's try to run this now and it fails because expected value is 0 0.33 but it was it should be 0.3333 JUnit allows you to add a rounding of error so as long as the two values are within 0 0.0001 it's considered as correct it's considered as equal so now when I run this it considers it as passing so this is the tolerance you go back to get value and this is correct the problem I have is with compare to but there's a really cool way of comparing fractions um, what you have to do is if b1 dot get numerator is more than minus 6 sorry so you don't compare them based on the value it's if the calling objects numerator multiplied by other objects denominator if it's more than the other objects numerator I can access them directly of course this numerator times other denominator is more than other numerator times this denominator you return 1 Similarly, if this numerator times other denominator is less than other numerator, this denominator you return minus 1, and in all other cases you return 0. So don't worry too much about it. It's a bit 
more mats than what we really care about. When I run this code, it still passes. So it's just for my OCD, it's just for my satisfaction that I know that running of errors can cause your program to fail. That's why I'm comparing them using this foolproof formula. But you don't have to worry too much about that. So that's writing JUnit tests for instance methods. So I hope that uh, I was able to cover the topics of week three lecture successfully. On Friday, James is going to go through more of this stuff in the lecture. And uh, I'm going to release a video with a walkthrough for the sample prac exam solution. So please stay tuned for that. Remember that uh, hacker rank I don't know if I remember the username correctly or not. We have a contest, yep, classes and objects. It's going to contribute 45% towards the first track exam, and it's an easy contest. It's easy, easier than the first two. The first two had a lot of problem solving. This one doesn't have any problem solving. All you have to do is add instance variables like this, add getters like this, add setters like this, Add constructor like this, add some method like this, to string compared to create deep copy and shallow copy. Deep copy is R becomes, oh, uh, sorry, R is a new rectangle. If S becomes R, that's a shallow copy. T is a new rectangle with R dot get width and r dot get height that's a deep copy so that's all the quiz assesses the contest assesses so all the very best for those of you who decide to stay in the unit if for whatever reason you decide to withdraw you should judge your own situation yourself but if it's best for you to withdraw i won't stop you all the best with whatever you guys do thank you very much and I'll see you very soon.